We're here for the BAFTA costume design session. We have the nominees here. We have Paco Delgado for the Danish girl. We have Jenny Bevan, who worked on Mad Max. We have Sandy Powell, who's hogging the stage with two films, <laughs> Carol and Cinderella. And we have Odile Dix Moreau, who worked on Brooklyn. I'm going to start with Paco. If you can talk a little bit about the Danish girl. Danish girl is um, a movie about two characters that um, already existed. One of them is Lily Elbert. She was uh, the first transgender person we know. When I had the first uh, talks with Tom Hooper, the director, he said to me that he wanted me to think that Lily was a woman that was trapped in a man's body, uh, almost like a jail. And that was the, more or less the sort of like the point of departure for the whole design. At the beginning, when she was uh, in Ina's body, to be like a sort of like a really rigid sort of uh, uh, costumes, like, you know, very, very tailored with high colors, really hard, and softening her up through the whole movie. I always think that costumes have a really, really amazing power to communicate and also to get emotions from other people. Sometimes people get so offended by the way you dress. And we have to think that at this time, a suit was always like, you know, assumed they were men. And this particular suit, we wanted to create this ambiguous feeling with it. If Lily was dressed as a woman, probably a lot of people wouldn't even question but I find sometimes ambiguities like much more shocking than the self-assurance that people would have if they saw Lily dressed as a woman. Jenny, if we move on to you, did George approach you and say we should have the girls dressed in a certain way? Um, George Miller had seen a ballet in, I think in Germany, possibly Pina Bausch, where the um, dancers were lightly bandaged and he loved that image. So he wanted me to try and use that in these girls who were basically kept in a bubble and were just there to breed for a Morton Joe because they're trying to create some kind of continuity and everyone is sick and these five women are not sick. After all that sort of strange mayhem of the war boys and the blood bags and the wretched and the milkers, suddenly there's something rather pure and innocent. We never had a script. We had a series of storyboards put into some kind of book form by Brendan McCarthy. So we had some images that had been created. What's quite extraordinary about a project like this is how normal it becomes. At the beginning, it's like, never seen, thought of anything like this, oh my God. And then as you work on the characters, they become completely normal and they are dressed according to what they need. And a lot of them need breathing apparatuses and they need body covering because they're all rotting, basically. And so these pure girls, I mean, the whole point is they're very pure. And I suppose I'm slightly emphasizing that. I do things terribly instinctively. And of course, George was incredibly involved. I mean, he's, he's not, um, I mean, he's a control freak, most directors are, but equally, he's a very giving control freak. I'm going to move to Sandy. How did you work with Todd? Well, I'll go back to the beginning of Carol when I read the book um, several years ago. I found it on a station. I read it in one, one fell swoop, thought this would make the most amazing film one day. I, you know, I really wish somebody would make this film. And at the time, I thought, and the best director would be Todd Haynes. Cut to, then everything just fell into place and Todd ended up doing it. Todd comes to every project massively equipped with reference material. I mean, he is sort of a little bit OCD about the amount that he does. And he provides a lookbook of images that include photographs, artwork, paintings, advertising, whatever it is, um, and gives to all the creatives. And then, incredibly, I looked at this book recently, and it's like looking at the film. It's sort of like, it's so, he really gives everything to you on a plate to begin with, but of course, other than that, we discuss how everything should be each of the characters and in this particular case we had very little time it was a prep time for the whole thing was six weeks or something for the younger character Therese it's a journey of self-discovery really here is her sort of transformation moment she has grown up found out who she really is and then also with the clothes she actually changes her style in that she's grown up she develops her own sort of sense of style that is inspired by and influenced by Carol. Because in the beginning she's very plain when we're first introduced she's her. Plain, well she's plain in that she's very young I mean she's been recently been a student and has had not much money so she dresses comfortably and practically I suppose a little bit arty maybe 
but not high fashion. You certainly can't afford high fashion. And that was a big contrast with Kate's character, Carol, who's older, with money and means, and is able to, to sort of spend her money on the most up-to-date looks. Now let's move on to Cinderella. Was that something you looked at the original, or did you...? The original meaning the, the animation. The cartoon, yeah. I looked at the animation at the very beginning when I took the job on, but I actually don't remember seeing it as a child. I didn't really reference it at all, consciously. I think that, but then when I look back at that, now there, there are elements that have been... But it's obviously, we know so much about the fairy tale style and the big ballroom dresses. Was that something you just instinctively knew you wanted to replicate or how did you want to put a twist to that? Well, the reason I was excited about doing Cinderella was I'd come straight off the back of the Wolf of Wall Street, which <laughs> could not, were, were full of testosterone, you know, and the only women in it were, you know, had no clothes on. So it was like, I want to do a girls film. I want to do a film about girls for girls. You know, what a great challenge. I've never done a fairy tale before, never done anything, you know, um, aimed at children either. And that was the exciting part. I mean, there's a lot of visual effects, the actual transformation scene, but with the butterflies, the butterflies was actually my idea at the very beginning when I designed the dress. And I knew it had to be the simplest dress in the ball, even though it's the biggest one. I wanted it to be the least decorated. Deliberately didn't give her jewellery, much to Disney's dismay. But it had to have some kind of decoration. I kind of thought Cinderella is at one with nature. And the original script, there were lots more scenes with animals, which ended up getting cut. But I thought, well, maybe there is something like the mice help to make the dress in the animation. The butterflies land on her to provide the decoration. So that's why I put the butterflies on the dress to begin with. And then the visual effects people... Magic dolls. <laughs> magic them on afterwards. Yeah, it came from, from me first and then working with the visual effects department, who were really great bunch of people and we worked together closely right the way through. But I mean, I, no, I didn't know it would look like that for that scene particularly. And we'll move on to Brooklyn. Uh, can you tell me a bit about your work on Brooklyn, how the film came to you? I've worked with uh, Fanola and Amanda on a couple of films now, so um, they asked me if I'd be interested in working on Brooklyn. And um, They're the producers. Producers, yeah. I love that period. I really like the early 50s. and. Um, it's a, quite a personal film for me, actually, because my father had just died beforehand and I'd had a difficult year, like you do with elderly gentlemen, and this was a sort of um, a film to escape in. It reminded me of my parents' meeting in 1948. My mother was French, my father was English, and I discovered all these little pictures of them when I'd gone through all my father's things. Two people meeting and trying to create a new life. Did you reference any real people, or did you look... Back I book. did most of my referencing from photographs, uh, my personal photographs of my family. Fanola had some wonderful home videos of her family because she was Irish and had gone to New Zealand and they were really great. And then we found some amazing little clips of people coming back from New York visiting Ireland on YouTube and that was just, you really got the difference between how they came back from um, America and how completely different they looked to the Irish. And so it was really good fun doing the Irish look, which were, you know, lovely home knits and handmade things. And then I never really done American clothing, so that was really nice because there's a lot more colour, more boldness in their choice of their clothing. So it was very, very nice to do the two looks. I wanted her to wear the same things in two similar scenes to emphasise her story and her conflicts you know, that she goes to Coney Island, which is so iconically American, and then suddenly you think, oh, yes, yeah, she's happy here. And then she goes back to Ireland, wears the same outfit, but um, actually she's there in a quandary, in a turmoil. She's being challenged by lots of personal emotions that lots of other people, I hope, have maybe felt themselves. So I'm going to ask a question for all of you now, which is, um, what's the process when you receive a script? Is it the same or does it differ from film to film? You know, if you actually want to do it and you've met the director um, and he's offered you the job, then it's a process of list making, to be quite honest. You know, writing it out, you just get it in your head, you get it in your head. And at the same time, you're researching, you're talking, your internet helps hugely these days for speedy access to images. But still, for me, there's nothing like looking through a book or in something if it's modern, I people watch. I did something years ago, but it was 
sort of Royal Academy types. I used to sit in the cafe, the Royal Academy, and just watch. Because completely different people go to the Royal Academy for their morning coffee than will go to Starbucks down Piccadilly. I mean, it's just... It's amazing how you can't know every period and every, every world that you work on, so you do have to go and sit Always sometimes. Learning. Yeah, It's impossible. Everyone thinks you're an expert on every period, but actually you're not. No, you, you know. learn every yeah. time. I mean, even if you've done a period before, if you, if you do another film set in the same period you've already done, yeah. it's always yeah. a different aspect different story, and you learn something else. Yeah. And when you get to the end of a job, you think, I always want to do it again because I know more. <laughs> you, exactly. you think, I wish I could go back and start again you. because, yeah, you've just, you've just understood it. I think also the amazing thing, I think you probably feel the same, is like, you know, the privilege we have to uh, be constantly like, learning new things. Yeah. I find that the most, for me, the most amazing thing, and I suppose for you too, is yeah. like all the, all, the, all the work we do before designing. I love to, you know, sort of merge into this sort of like mm -hmm. photography and paintings and looking at people. Yeah, I recently did a job which was set in the 90s, a true story. And so I had access to meet the real people who were being characterised. And so I went to meet this QC and he was completely flabbergasted at the detail I wanted to go into. And then, and I said, but this is the best bit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, on that note, mm. I would like to wrap up. <laughs> uh, Pago, Jenny, Sandy, Adil, thank you so thank much you. for coming. Thank you. And the more I progress, the more I realise this is incredible. This has never been told as a story. Mm. And this is, for me, the things that I have always gravitated towards, um, which is, you know, ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances, you know, the kind of people that you might live next door to or see mm. on the bus or whatever.